I'm Yannick Sanaquent. I'm a third year PhD student. Um, um, this is kind of like a last minute talk. It will be like kind of a break. But it's kind of seen as a primer of like, how can we actually uh, produce strong evidence with uh, limited resources that we all have, basically. And one of the solutions that I advocate here is using Bayesian sequential design. So it's a bit more practically focused than uh, the other talks. Uh, but, but, yeah, so gone. So obviously open science and reproducibility really need to come together uh, in order for us to have good science. Uh, and one big discussion that uh, went through the field and like uh, was very prominent, is like the whole, the whole discussion of a uh, replication crisis, low power, small sample sizes, which basically also uh, at heart is, a, is an issue of like that the evidence we are usually producing in our publications is not very strong. Um, uh, and beyond that, obviously, uh, we also are interested in not only always showing effects, but also showing no effects. Um, and that's actually where Bayesian statistics are really good at, um, because they basically allow us to provide a quantifiable evidence for null effects. Um, however, if we try to do this with um, like fixed end designs where you uh, before you pre-register or do your register report and you term, determine the sample size um, and you, you want to have like a, a sample size of which you have 80% probability to get a certain effect, uh, the sample sizes are really huge. And um, my main message here is that Bayesian sequential designs offer a really efficient way to produce this strong evidence without uh, uh, wasting so much resources. Um, much of what I will talk about today is uh, 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 based on this fantastic paper from Schoenbord and uh, Wagenmarker from 2018. And I highly recommend re you reading it, but I also have more um, introductory material at the end that uh, once I su uh, uh, successfully primed you, you check it out and, and get uh, into this kind of work yourself. All right, so um, with Bayesian statistics, uh, which all around of like this kind of formula, we can calculate a base factor, which is basically a ratio between two competing hypotheses, uh, with which we can um, quantify the evidence in, in, in favor of an alternative hypothesis over a null hypothesis. This is basically seen um, here, uh, or we can also do the reverse thing of uh, quantifying evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. And the crucial thing here is to, to know um, that uh, with Bayesian statistic, it's no problem at looking at your data um, uh, multiple times uh, because basically you always states the evidence uh, uh, between these uh, competing hypotheses, unlike, for instance, p values. Um, and like, however, like p values, they also convert uh, conventions basically how we can interpret base factors. And typically, specifically for registered report that I'm trying to focus on here, uh, most journal require you to plan for something that you get a base factor of six or 10, depending on where you submit. Um, for, my, for my simulation that I'm going to present to you in a second, I'm going to accept a base factor of over 10 for evidence for my alternative hypothesis and a base factor of one six as evidence for the null hypothesis. And the only reason why having this asymmetric cutoff is that it's just much more difficult to find strong evidence for a point hypothesis as a null uh, than it is for uh, something like an alternative in most cases. And I'm not talking here about just uh, as a uh, uh, clarification of like, I'm only doing one sample t-test here, but like this applies to basically all other statistical tests uh, you uh, might want to run in hypothesis testing at least. Um, so let's look how we do this in a traditional fixed end design. So what you see here in this graphic is basically, um, I, I run a simulation uh, for a couple of sample sizes, uh, 10,000 times, and I plotted a curve of, uh, for a medium effect size of 0 0.5. Uh, how often do I get a base factor of a 10? And when does this reach basically an 80% probability? That's the blue curve here. And for the red curve, the same thing for base factor below one six and a true uh, effect size of zero. Um, and what's immediately apparent uh, when you look at this graph, um, we need quite high sample sizes to, to get there. And specifically, if we want to um, provide evidence for null effects, you end up testing over 200 participants, which means if you do an MRI experiment, you, you, you will pay uh, over 100,000 pounds just for one experiment. Uh, and that's uh, obviously a huge problem. And I'm offering uh, a solution for this dilemma 
uh, now, and that's basically sequential um, designs. And the way that it works here, you start with a minimum sample size of let's say 10, and you run your statistics and you uh, investigate what's the base vector now, if it's already above or below your criterion um, that you've set uh, in your registration, then you immediately stop. If it's not, you, you add new data until you reach this criterion, basically. And that's illustrated in this simulation here, where each individual line is basically a simulated experiment in which the experimenter uh, um, uh, uh, looks at the base factor and only stop once they basically leave the plot either at the top of or the button when they surpass the criterion, basically. And uh, if you do this 10,000 times, you can uh, nicely draw distributions like this. Um, so here, a similar plot, but here we have, in addition, histograms with the same y-axis at the top of the button, uh, which shows you uh, how often do simulations end at a particular sample size that is uh, seen on the x-axis here. Um, and you can see that like, uh, just at, at a brief glance that only very few, um, so this is a true effect set of zero, and only every few, uh, there are only very few false positives, so like uh, accepting, str having strong evidence for the alternative hypothesis when the actual the null is true. So it worked really well, and this uh, technique is guaranteed to provide you strong evidence because you, you won't stop before that. Um, and you can also do this for like uh, a number of uh, different effect sizes. So here as a uh, as an contrast is how it looks for a medium effect size. And if you now look of like, um, if we look at the whole 10,000 times I've done this for this talk, um, the average sample size uh, now is like a bit over 80 for a null effect, uh, which is much lower than that for a maximum uh, for a traditional fixed end design. So if we uh, directly compare these two approaches, uh, instead of, uh, on average, instead of uh, always testing 200 participants or over that, we, we only need to do 80, uh, which uh, cuts the research cost on average by half. Um, but at the same time, you're providing the same level of evidence. Um, so it's, it's, it's not always needed to, to provide that many participants. Uh, the major drawback of doing this in that way, obviously, is that on very rare occasions, you would test up to a thousand, up to two thousand, or even more participants, which as PhD students and even at labs, uh, is quite not, it's not feasible. Um, and what you can do is you can basically say, uh, within, I do this within reasonable limits. Let's say as my, for one experiment that I'm running in my PhD, the maximum that I'm running is 100. So you can run the same simulation again and see how this affects the uh, evidence that you are likely to produce, which is kind of divine. So with a null effect, uh, the distribution now looks like this. So we cut off the simulation here and then stop with a base factor we basically ended up with. We can do the same thing for a medium effect size, which look like this. Um, and now if you, if you basically analyze the distribution, you can say, you see that with a null effect, you still get a strong evidence in 80% of the cases but with an average sample size of only 58. So much, much, much less than to the 200 uh, something that we got in a fixed um, end design. So sometimes we can actually get away with um, uh, collecting uh, much less data than we actually need, while as again, uh, providing the same level of evidence. So uh, my take home message for you basically is, I think Bayesian sequential designs are really un, uh, underused in our field. I haven't seen any like papers so far like really using this, but I think it's a really, really um, a good way actually to provide strong evidence while saving resources, our time, our money that's given to us by taxpayers. Uh, and I think uh, you should look into this. Um, if, if this works for like your current project or your current uh, registered report, um, if you want, uh, here's a couple of primers, like all the code can be found uh, and also some background information of like, why is this actually even possible? Why is this not problematic? Because uh, with frequent statistic, you couldn't do this in the same way uh, uh, for several reasons. And um, that's basically all that I wanted to tell you today.